Welcome, everybody, coming in from the waiting room there. Welcome to Intro to Tapestry Weaving here on a beautiful Monday afternoon. Darren is your instructor there on screen. He's going to be showing us how to make a loom really quickly and then going over weaving basics and some fancier stitches, showing off one of his creations there. My name's Claire. I'll be hanging out in the Zoom chat, answering your questions there, or forward them on to Darren to, uh, so he can answer them. I'll also be putting both the uh, handout with all of the stitch instructions, as well as the directions for making your own cardboard loom into the chat there. So if you don't have that open, go ahead and do it now. And a reminder that this class is being recorded. So you'll be able to watch this all back again as many times as you need to. And it'll be available tomorrow afternoon on michaels.com slash classes. And with all of that, I'm gonna let Darren take it away. Okay, so welcome to class. Um, just to let you know, there's I, there's a lot to cover today, so um, we probably won't cover everything, but this will just be a great introduction into weaving to just give you some ideas to inspire you. And then maybe you can do some research and like, like for future learning, like you can take some of the, the points in the handout um, and just continue your research and have um, an opportunity to, to do that because we just have an hour. So um, if we want to go ahead and switch to the overhead view, let me get my camera ready and we'll go ahead and start. Okay. All right. So first of all, this is, this is just a basic tapestry loom. Um, but if you don't want to buy a loom, if you just want to kind of practice without investing any money into it, I did have some directions on how to make a loom and there was a video sent out. Hopefully had a chance to review that. But just quickly, um, just take a piece of cardboard. Um, it's nice if the corrugated centers are running in different directions because that adds strength to it. So a piece like this, a, and then just glue it down with some wood glue or some like craft glue. Um, and then put the second piece on top of it, the third piece, I mean, so you have three pieces. And once this is glued together, it's actually pretty secure. Um, and then we're going to put three or four layers of just these little strips of cardboard across the bottom and then across the top. And then what you're gonna wanna do is take the one that's gonna be on top and you're going to want to peel a layer of the cardboard away to kind of reveal the corrugated center. And you can take a tapestry needle and kind of use that to pick, oh, pick it apart if you need to. And then we're going to glue that here. And then you'll glue the second one here. And what that does is that creates um, these areas here, which will um, guide where your string goes for when you're warping it, and it'll hold everything in place. So that way your, your warp strings are not laying flat down against the cardboard. There's a little bit of space, which makes it nice. And then you have um, the spacing here, which kind of keeps them spaced out evenly, which also makes it a little bit nice. So this, you can actually do a lot on a, a little loom like this, and you can make them quite big. See, this one's not super tiny, but just for like zero money down, like with just maybe the cost of some glue, you probably have boxes at home. You can have a very functional, very nice loom, make several projects on it. And then if you decide you really like it, then you can invest in another loom. The, I think the one I have costs like 80 bucks. So they're not super cheap, but I mean, it's not a huge, huge financial investment either. So are there any, any questions about um, making the loom? out of cardboard and how that would go. Any questions about that? Nothing so far, but if any pop up in the chat, I will let you know. Yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. The directions I wrote out probably make it sound a lot more complicated than it needs to be, but it's it's really not a hard, and there, there are other videos on um, YouTube how to do it too as well. I mean, I certainly didn't invent this. So there's this is something that you can do. All right, so once you get once you get your loom and either buy one or make one, 
the next thing you have to do is you have to put your um, warp threads on your loom. And the warp threads are the threads that um, go vertical. So they'll go from top to bottom this direction. And they're usually not decorative, but they can be. So a lot of times you're going to see them just um, like with this thin, I'm using here, I'm using a, it's called Trubu. And it's a bamboo yarn by Lion Brand. And it's available on lionbrand.com and on michaels.com. And it's not a stretchy yarn. So that's what makes it good for the warp. And it's a nice, thin, smooth yarn. So it's not going to kind of take over. While course, you're warping there, Darren, okay. what's the brand of the wooden loom you have? I think it's this, is it called Sash the School Loom? How do you pronounce it, Claire? Oh, I think it's pronounced Shocked, but shocked. I'll type it in the chat. Yeah, and it's the School Loom. It's the one we used to sell at the studio. I've used this one several times. I quite like it. It um, has a built-in like easel. You put it together and it'll stand up, which makes it nice to work on that way. And so there's nothing fancy about um, if you want to try a rigid heddle loom, which is a different style of weaving, it's a little more expensive to get a loom that way. Um, I know warping those, the, set, the warp, warping of those can be quite um, a little bit more complicated and quite involved. But for the tapestry loom, um, the warping is, is pretty easy. It's not such a big deal. Okay. I'm just going to warp part of this loom for an effort to save time. So if you're, if you're making something on a loom, you don't have to warp the whole loom um, if you wanted to make just a narrow piece for a specific project. And then I'm just wrapping this around the last peg um, to secure it. And then I'm just gonna tie it off in like a square knot. So no, no fancy knots, nothing. And then you just wanna kind of run your hands over it to just make sure that none of these warp threads are like really loose or really tight. And this will kind of even them out a little bit if they are. So for your warp threads. Question on the warping, Darren. How tight should the tension be? Should you be like yanking the yarn really hard or? No, you don't want them. So you can see here, I don't know if you can. Um, let me see if I can pull it up. You can see there's quite a bit of play in them. They're not loose, they're not slack. This one might be a little slack, but you don't want them really tight. Um, that would be more of a problem because if they're super tight, when you cut them to release them, they're, they're gonna kind of spring back into shape and that can distort your um, weaving. So you do want them to have um, a little bit of play in them, but not a lot. And then once, what you can do to help even that out next, what I do is um, just these are cardboard strips and I weave these in and out, just the basic weave across the top and the bottom. And that helps to uh, put a little more tension in it. So if they're slightly loose, then this will help put a little more tension in it. Is there, how would you say it, Claire? How tight should they be? Is there a way to express that better? That's a good good way. I mean, they should be taut, I would say is a better word than tight. Yeah. So there's a little bit of bounce to them. Um, but you said in a, a basic weave for someone who's never woven anything before, could you clarify what that is? Okay, so the basic weave is called a tabby weave. And what that is, is over one warp thread and under the next. So it's just over, under, over, under. So you're just going over one, and under one. And then the next row, you'll reverse it. So if you go over, under, over, under, the next row will be under, over, under, over. And that's what kind of locks them in place. And after I weave this piece of cardboard in, I'll show you what that looks like. So you get these cardboards in. These are called spacers, and they help to space out your warp evenly. And then they're also going to force you to save some room at the bottom and the topper. You'll put one at the top. 
So that way, when you're finished your weaving, when you take these out, that will give you plenty of room to tie off these ends and to, to sew them in place. You don't wanna do your weaving clear down to the very edge because you won't be able to finish it off as well. So these spacers, they um, save some space for finishing, but they also kind of, they also space out your warp threads a little bit. Okay, let me zoom in on this. So you can see here, this warp thread, if you follow this one, it's going over this cardboard and then under the next one. This one's going over and then under, over and then under. So they're always kind of alternating um, over and under. And that's what kind of locks the weaving in place. If you just put them all um, the same, like this one, if I were to just slide this next one in with the same warp threads going over and under, then it wouldn't hold it in place. It, it would just fall apart. So locking them in place by taking them over and under is what um, makes it stay together. Does that make sense? I think so. We've got a couple questions. Okay. Uh, Kimberly wants to know, do you really need two cardboard pieces or could you just use one? Like one at the top mm -hmm. and one at the bottom? You can just use one. I mean, you could do, you don't even have to have them if you don't want to. I like to have two because it kind of balances the tension and kind of keeps everything nice and even. But if you only want to use one, then you can just use one and see how you like that. Um, if you don't um, want to use any, you know, try try it like that. But I do find that it it helps to it helps it if you do use the cardboard. You can use paper, you could use plastic, you can use lots of different things. What do you think, Claire? You 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 do a lot of weaving, or you have done. I have done, yeah. Um, you could also use like a, a very, very thick yarn at the bottom and that would help space it out. But you'd yeah, want to do at least like an inch and a half or two inches. Yep. And then for those who have done the cardboard loom, the warp goes all the way around that loom, right? So here's a cardboard loom, a small one. And then I just, I'm finished with this one. So they're, they're kind of pulling out. But yeah, you just wrap it around and then around the back and then back around the front. So you just take it all the way around. That's the best way I found to warp these cardboard ones. And all you do is you just kind of tie it in a nice secure knot at the beginning and the end. Nothing fancy or nothing special. And then you're ready to start weaving. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that back view was helpful for everybody. Okay, good. So just a couple of tools to help help with your weaving. You do need, it's nice to have tapestry needles. So it's a, it has to have an eye big enough for whatever size yarn you're using. And then it doesn't need to have a sharp tip. So a blunt tip is nice. This is a weaving comb and you'll use this when you weave your um, weft in, then this will comb it down and kind of bring everything um, into place. If you don't have one of these, you can use just a regular comb. Um, you can use a fork or just a regular, regular comb that you have. Um, just one of these, regular. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. The bristles are a little small on this side. So, you know, I think I'll find a bigger one is a little easier to use. So you don't have to go out and buy a lot of fancy tools if you don't want to. You can use, um, these are needles for doll making or for, um, it's called a mattress needle as well. You can use to go through a mattress for tufting for upholstery. So you can also use these if you happen to have any of these around. And that's pretty much all you need. Um, you can use this, this is called a shuttle and you can load your yarn on this and then use that to weave in this way. And then you pull it through and pull the yarn with it. Um, I also have this one. And this one is either, I use this as a shed stick or a pickup stick and I'll demonstrate that here in a few minutes. So any questions about any of the tools? Doing okay? I think we're doing okay. We've got some love for those longer needles. I think they look a little dangerous myself, but. <laughs> I, I actually was bleeding earlier. I stabbed my hand right here by mistake. Uh-oh. 
So they are now that they, they are quite sharp because they are used for a different purpose, but they can be used for for this as well. So this um, wooden stick that I've just put through now is either called a shed stick or a pickup stick. And what that does, you want to leave. Once you weave this through, you want to leave it in place. And if I turn it this direction, I'm not sure if you can see. I tilt my loom. You see what that does is it creates this open space between the warp threads, and that open space is called a shed. And you can pass your yarn through that shed, and then you let it flat, move it out of the way. And then on the way back, you have you do have to manually go up and down. So let me show you how that works. I'm going to start with this purple yarn. I'm just going to use a traditional darning needle. Okay, so open up your shed. And then just pass the darning needle through, bring your yarn through. And you can use your shed to pound it down, or you can use a fork or your comb, whichever one. Now the dangerous part, and sometimes this happens to me as well, is if you pull it too tight, you can pull your edges in. So I'll show you what that looks like. So now on my back pass, I have to manually weave it up and down. So I'm just going over one and under one, alternating differently from the row before. And then just pull that through. Looks like I split my yarn. So pull all the pieces of the yarn through. So now what you wanna do here is if you look right here, if you pull it too tight, you can see how it pulls the edge in. And that's not gonna, it's not going to be nice. And that happens. So you just want to be really careful. It still happens to me. Um, you just have to be really careful not to. One thing you can do is you can kind of hold it and kind of pull it out. And then you also leave this. You don't want to put this flat. You want to leave it. Um, I saw some people, they do it like this or just on a diagonal. And then when you put it down, it gives it enough slack so that it doesn't pull it tight. If you go straight across at first, and then when you push it down, it doesn't give it enough slack. And then after you do that row by row, it tends to pull in because it's not really going straight across. It's going up and down, up and down, up and down around all of those warp threads. And then every now and then you might wanna give it just a little pull out like that so that you don't um, let it pull in by mistake. And then for the next pass, you can use your shed stick. So I'm gonna open up my shed and then pass this through. And again, you don't wanna pull it tight. You wanna make sure you're leaving plenty of ease. Um, put it more on a diagonal slant and then bring it down. And it's not a bad idea just to make sure and give it a little And then if you put, if you force it down way too tight, sometimes that can cause it to buckle in because you're not letting it have any slack at all. So any questions about anything so far? This is called, um, you'll hear it called either traditional weave, basic weave, or it's called a tabby weave, like a tabby cat. And then on the back. Yeah, I think pass, the the terms most often used I've heard are tabby weave, or it's also called just plain weave. Plain. Any questions about this tabby weave? And do you have any tips, Claire, about not letting the ends pull in? Basically what you've said so far, I usually make sure and pull my uh, weft yarn at a, like a 45 degree angle. Like that. And then I try to pinch the edge of it with my opposite hand. So I'm not accidentally yanking that side in. But it does take some practice, so. It does take practice. So 
don't be discouraged if it pulls in. Okay, Any anything else about the tabby, the tabby weave? No? Okay, the next oh, one I want to show you. Okay. Move too fast for the chat. <laughs> um, Diane wants to know, why don't you stand up the shed stick on the way back? And I think that's related to the next question here, where you can put two shed sticks in there. And I've seen that before where you can have, you know, one for one set of threads coming up and one for the other set of threads coming up. But I believe you have to insert them in a particular way. And I've never actually done it myself. I've never done that either, but let me demonstrate this. So if I open my shed this way and I pass yarn through and then put it down and then I open my sh shed stick again and pass the yarn through, what's gonna happen? It's just gonna pull back out, right? Because it's going in one direction and back out the exact same way. So a couple of things. If the problem with like inserting another shed stick is it makes it, and there, I, Claire's right, there is a certain way of doing it, but I've never done it either. But like the most logical idea is to just go ahead and put another one but you can't really do that. It seems like you should be able to, but it's not possible because get this one out of the way. So I'm open up my shed, put it down. And then I want to open up this shed. It won't open because this other shed stick is going to block it. So you really can't have two, um, unless there is a certain way to do it, which I, I'm not um, able to teach at this time either because I've never done it. But one thing you can do, and this is another one, is if you you can take a piece of a loop of a string and tie around every other one and pull that up in lieu of a shed stick. And you can do different kinds of soft sheds that way, which is a whole other topic for a different day. So, but you this just holds it for one direction. And then on the backwards pass, you do have to weave it back through manually. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. All right, so I have, so you don't always have to use yarn. Um, I'm gonna show you now, this is just some roving, which I bought and I planned on spinning it into yarn, or maybe I was going to felt with it. I don't remember now, but it does beautiful things when you weave with it. So I'm going to take this, see if I can zoom in, use this roving, and I'm going to do this next stitch, which is called sumac. So you just kind of secure it. We'll have to weave all of these in later, but you wrap each, you're going to wrap each warp separately. And I'm, I'm moving this direction. So I want to wrap, um, I'm going to go back the opposite direction to wrap the warp. So I'm going to wrap the warp this direction like this. And with this one, because I'm using such a thick piece of fiber, you don't have to do every one. If you do every one, that can really crowd them. And it, instead of your weaving pulling in, it can actually push out. So I'm going to skip a couple. So you pick up your thread this direction, go over it. And then you're going to move backwards. You're going to take it under it. And you can see it's creating these nice big thick puffs. So pick up a thread, a warp thread, lay it on top of it, and then bring it back under it. And you don't, I, I'm, I kind of ran out. I don't have enough to go clear across, 
but you don't necessarily have to take it clear across. Um, each one of these stitches you can do part of the way or you could go the whole way across. And then for this little bit that I, I'm just going to kind of tuck that in the back and that can be woven in or secured later. So that creates, you can see this great, this great big piece of fluffy texture. And if I want to keep going, just put enough in the back and we'll probably twist that a little bit later on to make it a little more secure to weave it in. And then just go pick up a thread, lay your fiber on top of the thread, tuck it back under the thread to secure it, and then pick up the next thread. Any questions about this technique called sumac? Uh, perhaps not just for this technique, but in general. Do you usually move from right to left when weaving? I mean, for a plain weave, you'll go back and forth in both directions, but for a, a stitch like this, does it matter which direction you start from? Um, you know, on, I'm gonna say no. Um, I don't think that it does. And it's kind of funny because for a regular tabby weave, you do go back and forth, left to right, left to right. And of course you wouldn't have to for this stitch, but I tend to go back and forth just because I think it's a nice flow for weaving. So for going back the other direction with this one, I'm gonna start on this side and go back. Um, I don't think it matters. Does it matter, Claire, or not? Because it, it just seems like the right thing to do for me. Maybe it doesn't matter. I think it will affect the look of that, like the sumac a little bit, but you know, with a fluffy yarn, you're just adding a lot of texture to the piece. And so whichever direction is easier for Mu to move it, you to move in. And if you just want to put one line of sumac in, then go for it. Yeah, but I, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just like, it's just psychology. It just seems to me like when you're weaving, you should go back and forth, but you absolutely wouldn't have to. And then if you do two rows of the sumac right on top of each other, kind of looks like a braid. So let me finish this real quick and then I'll show you that. You can see how it kind of looks like, and I was kind of doing it quick. So these are all kind of uneven and different lengths, which is kind of a nice look, or you could be very careful and make sure that you do them all the exact same. Um, tension and the exact same amount and have them very uniform looking. Okay, that's called sumac. Do we have any questions about the sumac? No? Okay, so the next stitch I wanna show you then is called twining. So it's it's like the word twine. And I'm going to do that. You can do it with one color, but I'm going to do it with two colors because it will be easier for you to see what I'm doing. And it also makes um, kind of a decorative twist if it's done with two colors. So it'll be it's kind of fun. So I'm going to take these two colors and I'm going to tie them in a knot. It just helps me you probably wouldn't have to, but it kind of holds things a little more securely together. And one thing I found um, this twining, it really helps to space out your warp threads. So if you're doing a lot of tabby weave or other types of weave and you end up, say you, you've messed up several times and you're not going over, under, over, under, you're, you've messed up your your warps and they're just, it's just not right anymore. Instead of ripping everything out, if it's looking okay, you can do a couple rows of this twining and that will kind of force everything back in place and give you a fresh place to start from. So that's one good thing about this. And it also really makes your weaving very secure. So for the twining, um, you just, just start out, just kind of loop it around the first warp thread and then you take one of your weft 
strings and take it under the next thread. And then you take the next one of your warp, I'm sorry, of your weft and take it under the next warp. And then you kind of bring that down. And so the red one is kind of going to cross over the yellow and under the next warp to secure it. And then the yellow is going to cross over top of the red and under the next warp. Aaron, can you just check and see if something's rubbing against your mic? There's some weird noise. Okay, is that better? I think that's better. I think probably the loom was just rubbing against it as you moved. <laughs> probably. I've got a lot more stuff on my desk today than I usually do. All right, so the yellow, it has to cross up over the red and then under the warp. And then the red crosses up over the yellow and under the warp. Are you able to see what that, I'm going to move up a little bit away from the sumac so we can see what it looks like. Are you able to see what I'm doing? Make sense? Yeah, that's a nice effect. You get like a nice barber pole kind of stripe. Yep. It looks like I missed a warp right here. So you could go back and pick that up or you could just leave it behind. I'm going to leave it behind this time. On the way back, I like to do two rows of this um, just because it gives it a real nice secure edge. But I probably won't this time, but just for so we can move on to the next one. But I really like to do this um, this twining stitch. It's one of my favorite ones. This and this sumac. I feel like you get a lot of um, bang for your buck. Like it makes it much more interesting than just the regular tabby weave, which is very pretty. Do it. My shed stick's hitting against my microphone now. So, any questions? We do have a couple. Um, can you get the same effect by just twisting the yarn? Angie wants to know. I'm not sure what she exactly means by twisting. Um, I'm, I'm going to say no, you wouldn't get the same effect, but you might get a nice effect. I'm not sure what she means either by twisting, but. Um, like twisting it like this, because that's the same thing. If you twist this one, and then it's basically the same thing, only looking at it in a different way, maybe. I mean, you could certainly twist it separately and then have that as like a decorative strand on top of the warp, but this connects it to the warp, so it's gonna stay in place. Yeah, this makes it very secure. Now, as you can see, like that red and yellow stands out quite a bit, but because this sumac is so fluffy, it's actually like overshadowing everything around it. So if, think about that as you're doing your weaving, if, you know, if, if you've got this great big fluffy cloud here, you might not want to use like your favorite yarn or your favorite, if you have a little bit of fabric or something you're using, you might not want it right there. You might want to do something really plain until you are able to get past that so that it shows because um, it's really not going to let anything show that's around it. So just think about that kind of stuff as you're working as well. One more question on the, the twining, twining, twining. twining. I've never actually said it out loud. <laughs> well, it's like it's like twine. It's basically similar to how twine is made, how it's wrapped around itself. Yeah. Lynn wanted to know if you wanted a thicker appearance for any stitch, could you use like two strands of gold yarn and one strand of burgundy? Absolutely. It would be sort of like a little thick and thin look. Yeah, that could be really pretty. Um, 
anything like that will make it more interesting or gives you a different look. You could use yeah, a very thin strand of yarn. Um, you could use a really thick strand and give it, you know, a real thick and thin look would be fun. Don't let people tell you no, you can't do stuff. I say do it. You might invent the next best thing and leave it. Any other questions? Back one more time with the twining. Okay, we're pretty good with this. It's not hard to do. It might look hard when you're watching me do it if you're not able to clearly see what I'm doing, but I promise you when you do it, it's really not hard at all. It's actually quite fun. Um, Hetty here in the chat did point out this is also a good way to start out your weaving piece. Yeah, um, actually, I, I just kind of jumped right into this. I didn't really start it out um, the best way. Um, I do like to start out with one row of the twining and then work a couple of rows of tabby weave and then do one more row of twining to finish that off to kind of create like a, like a salvage edge. And you can use that, then you can fold it under and hem it and sew it in place to give yourself a really, really secure edge depending on what this piece is gonna be used for. I've made a couple of wall hangings and I didn't really do all that with it and they seem to be fine. But if it's a piece that's gonna get much wear or tear, um, then you might wanna do that to really secure it in place. But if you don't fold it under and sew it and you start out with the twining and then do some tabby and then have another twining above it, that's just gonna give you a very, very secure edge that will help your weavings to last for a long time. So yeah, it's a very good idea to start out that way. All right, any question, any other questions? We have a good question from Suri. How do you measure the yarn for the number of rows you want to weave? Well, you know, I really don't. But if, if I knew I wanted to, so one strand across like this, if you measure the exact length of it, it's not really accurate because it's not going straight across. It's going up and down, up and down. So I would probably say like, like one and a half would probably give you a good length across. So maybe measure it out like that and then kind of count them out like this and then give yourself a little extra at the end. Like if you want it to go across 20 times, kind of count out like that 20 times and then maybe add a couple, like two or three extra so you don't run out. What do you think, Claire? Is there a, a proper formula for that? For tapestry, I think that's probably a good way to do it if you're going to use little bits of multiple colors. If you wanted to make, if you had like a floor loom or a rigid heddle loom and you wanted to do say a scarf or something, there are formulas you can use to work out how much yarn you'll need. Um, I don't remember them off the top of my head right now, yeah, but if you have like a basic weaving book, they'll be in there. Yeah, rigid heddle weaving, it's, it's a lot similar to this, but it's quite a bit more complicated. So for this basic one, usually I'll just wind off as much yarn as I think I want to work with it. Usually it's how much it's going to be comfortable for me to go back and forth with. And then if I run out and I want to continue on with that same color, I'll just start with more of that color. But you don't want to have like yards and yards and yards of yarn trying to weave it under and back and forth because it, it tends to get a little bit cumbersome. That's where a shuttle like this comes in handy. And you can load it on like this. Let's see if I can do this quickly. You can kind of do it like this. That's a good point, because even with a shuttle, if you're doing rigid heddle or if you have a floor loom, you can't put the whole project's worth of weft yarn on one shuttle. So you're still going to have some ends to weave in later. So if you have a shuttle like this, then you can put more on and it's, it's a little bit more manageable, but still you wouldn't put like a whole spool yarn, a whole ball of yarn on here. It would get to be too much. 
So for these small projects, I don't really worry about that as much. But um, you can experiment, you know, like do a couple, like do three or four rows and then mark how much yarn you use, take that yarn out, measure it, and then measure the row and say, okay, after you do a certain amount of math, you can figure out how to do that. But I'm, I'm not good at math, so I'm not gonna comment on that really. Now that you've got the yarn on the shuttle, can you show how to use that for a few rows? Uh -huh. And I think we do need to move the mic back if the shed stick is whacking against it. <laughs> All right, let's try it over here. I don't have a very big, very wide desk and this loom's taking up a lot of space. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the next little trick that I wanna show you. So with this one, this one is making, um, it's called a loop pile. So like a nice, a thick, like a big pile rug with like really thick and plush. So the first thing you do is you just do a row of plain tabby and then you just keep it loose. And then I'm gonna use this big knitting needle, but you can use um, anything that you have handy, like a broomstick or a chopstick or anything, depending on how big you want it to be. And then you just pick up, I'm gonna do it from this side. You just pick up and pull up your warp, I'm sorry, your weft between the warp threads and you bring it around whatever you're using. You could use a, anything that's handy. I just happen to have a lot of knitting needles, so. And see how I'm just pulling it up and wrapping it around the knitting needle. Okay. And then you're going to go back and do a tabby weave on the way back. And you want to do like two more rows of tabby weave to kind of lock it in place. But for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to do the one row. But if you're really making a weaving and you wanted it to hold up, it's better to do two or three rows. And then if you do, and then do um, continue to do these loops like that, you'd have a very pretty, very plush um, loop pile. And you could actually make a rug. Um, they, it doesn't have to be a wall hanging or a pillow or something. You could make this into a rug. You'd have to get the proper backing so it doesn't slip. But um, you could make a very thick plush pile rug. And then if you want cut loops, then you can just go through and cut these. So you don't have to leave them as loops. You can go through and cut them. And if you um, were to do this, I would definitely recommend putting uh, probably three rows of tabby weave to start, then do your loops, then put three rows of tabby at the after them, and then cut your loops because you don't want them to pull out. So, and then you can go back over the top of them and kind of trim them up nicely. Okay, want to see me do that again? Do we have any questions about that? It's pretty I easy. Just give you, oops, I just want to give you a time check. We're about 15 minutes to five o'clock now. We okay. want to make sure and show people how to take stuff off the loom. Let's jump to that. And then if we have any other follow-up questions, we can come back to it because finishing up is also very important. And it's not hard is the good news. Okay, so I've prepared this. I did this quickly this morning and you can see mine are pulling in a little bit because I was being quick and not being super careful, but this is a good example. I, I did these two practice quick weavings. And so if you want to do two pieces of weaving, like you don't have, like I can, you can do them both on the same loom on the same warp and then cut them apart. You don't have to like rewarp your loom every time. 
So I have these edges, these loose strings. So I'm gonna weave these in. Let me show you how to do that because you want a nice neat. And the way I like to do it is I'm going to take them vertical um, and kind of put them in where the warp threads are. So I'm kind of sewing them vertically kind of up into where the warp threads are. And then I'll take it back up. And that's one way of doing it. And then you also want to double check and make sure it's not showing from the back. You want it to look nice on the front and the back if possible. And then just trim these off. Or you can kind of take it more of a horizontal way, but you do run a risk of interfering with your weaving. So I don't like to do it this direction, horizontal, as much because um, you might run the risk of making your weaving look less even and nice. What do you think, Claire? Do you go horizontal or vertical for this? I do it do horizontal, do it? Um, but I do it as I'm still weaving the piece. So when I have to change yarn or add new, I'll weave like maybe one or two passes and then tuck the tail end in on the next one. And that way all you have to do when you're done is trim them off the back. That's probably the smartest way. I'm sure that's probably the best and smartest way. Yeah. So once you get to this point, we've woven all of your ends in. I like to finish with, also finish it with a hem stitch. So I'm gonna do the hem stitch with this gold yarn so that you can clearly see what I'm doing. And I've already done that on the other edges. So on this one, I did this really pretty, um, the twining with the two colors and it's nice and it's very decorative, but it's kind of going to get ruined when I do the hem stitch. So if this were a real piece, you probably wouldn't want to do such a pretty edge where you're going to use your hem stitch into it. You might want to just do something more, just do this with one regular color. And then of course you would um, do hem stitch with the same color because you don't want it to show up as much. So with hem stitch, you're going to go underneath two of your warps and then you're going to go up here underneath two layers of your weft. So kind of where that twining is. And then you're going to go under the next two warp. And then go under, go too deep of your weft. And then go under two warp. And then two weft. And that will help. Could you zoom in on this bit, Darren? Okay. Oops. Let me start the next one. So go under two. I know I've got off track. I've messed up my, I've messed it up. That. I'm going to 
round two, and then you go into the body of your work and go under two of the wax. Go wrap it around two of the warps, and then go up here under two of the wafts, wrap it around, the, bring it through. Two, wrap it around. And then this really secures it going in through two. You don't do this very often. It's kind of like binding off for knitting. not something you don't seem to do only at the end of the project, so. But with um, this twining along the edge, technically you really wouldn't have to do this, but it does give it that little extra bit of security depending on what you're going to use. Now I ran out. So if I were really making a real project, you'd have to, I'd have to go through and finish it. But then what you want to do is you're just going to cut everything off. And then depending on how you had your, like with the cardboard loom where you end up with these great big long strings, um, you'll wanna trim them down. If you're using a loom like the, the wooden loom that I have, where you don't end up with the great big long strings, you'll end up with loops. And you might not wanna cut those loops. You might wanna leave those loops intact because you could put um, like a curtain rod or a piece of driftwood through those loops and hang your weaving directly from those. And then with these, I like to tie them in a knot just to kind of secure them. And then depending on how you feel about it, some people like these fringes as a decorative edge and some people do not so i'm going to show you you can just weave those in but you do want to tie them off so that your weaving doesn't just slip off of them and then you could then tie them a second time like this, but that's gonna make them a little more visible. And then you can do a decorative edge where you just keep tying the ones next to each other and kind of make a diamond shaped decorative edge. Or once you tie them off in the back, Then you just want to lightly just kind of weave them in and make sure it's not showing up on the front. So you don't want to go deep. You just want to kind of go under one layer. See, there's where my needle is. Check this side, make sure you're not seeing the needle. If, if you're seeing the needle like that, that means when you pull the thread through, it's going to go the same path the needle went. So just make sure the needle's not showing and then just kind of pull it down through. And then you could take it back up if you really wanna make sure it's extra secure. If you're gonna leave the fringe, at least have a good question. Should you be cross tying the warp threads so that your weft doesn't come out at the bottom? Um, I would, if you're gonna leave the fringe, then what I would do is, so like this one, these two little bundles are together, tie those really tight like that, and then tie these two, which the, the um, hem stitch kind of groups them together. So I'm gonna tie the ones that the hem stitch group together in a nice tight little knot, and then take one from each side and tie those. 
into a nice tight knot. Now you could plan ahead. And if you know you're gonna leave a fringe, then you could use a color of yarn or string that's gonna look nice with it. Like you could have used a red or a gray or black, something that would be more decorative. So like on this little, this cardboard loom here, I warped it with the red. So if you wanted to leave the fringe, then it would be, it would look more planned out and more part of the decoration. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Would you finish the top of the piece in the same way? Or I yeah. guess it depends on how you're going to use the finished piece. It depends on how you're going to use the finished piece. Um, if you're going to use it as a wall hanging, you can leave or just tie them into loops or leave them in loops if they were on uh, like the wooden loom and just slip a piece of like a curtain rod or a piece of driftwood or something through to hold it from those loops. Or you can just finish it exactly the same way. And you can have fringe along the top hanging down and you could bring the fringe towards the front to be seen or tuck it in the back, not to be seen, or you could weave in your ends. Okay, anything else? Emily had a good idea that you could also add like beads to the fringe, um, probably after tying the knot. Yeah, that would be really pretty. Or you could put the beads on as you're tying. So here, this is a big piece that I did. That is one of my large weavings. And then here's one. This, this loom here is, it's just an old bed frame from Ikea and the bed, I threw the bed away, but we ended up keeping this frame and everyone's always like, oh my God, that's a great loom. Where did you get that loom from? I'm like, it's an old bed frame. But like, this is the, the cut pile that I did. And you can see it's, it's very three dimensional. You can get, get some really interesting looks. And then this is some old um, silk fabric cut. And then this is just, um, all of this here is um, twining. I did all together, so it looks really cool. So there's lots, lots and lots of things you can do with a loom and do with weaving. Any questions at all? Anything? Talking to myself, still muted there. <laughs> Everyone was very impressed with your uh, pieces there. Um, ooh, yeah, quarantine weaving, right? What else are you gonna do? <laughs> uh, we did have a question. How did you make the curves and the waves in the piece? Oh, those I don't, when I weave, I don't usually go back and forth in perfect rows. I like things to be much more organic looking, especially, especially if it's gonna be a piece of wall art like this. So I, I don't take it all the way back and forth. I might start in the middle of the loom and do a couple of rows and then start on the end and bring it. And when you get to that other piece, just kind of go over it and kind of make humps and then make triangular sections and then, and then bring a stripe that covers the triangular section and the hump. And then once you get that going, you just follow that across. It's really, it's not, it's, it's really fun. And there's no planning. You just start weaving and whatever yarn you have and whatever yarn is within your reach and whatever mood you're in, that's what you do. So yeah, it's just fun to experiment. Just do whatever. And we had a couple questions on the best way to clean it or how you keep those protected from dust. The best, again, depending on what you're, so like a huge one like this, the best thing to do is I, I haven't really had to clean them much yet because they're not very old, but I would think just like the vacuum, just like running the vacuum over them. Um, if, if you make small pieces, like if they were placemats or something and you used acrylic or cotton, you could run them through the washing machine if you wanted to. I prefer to hand wash everything that I make because I've gone to the trouble of making it and hand washing things and laying them flat to dry helps to keep them nicer for much, much longer. So that's always my answer is to hand wash and lay flat to dry because the washing machine and the dryer, even if it's possible to, to do it that way, it's not as good for your clothes. And if it's just a t-shirt from the Gap, 
who cares? But if it's a hand woven placemat that you've made a set of six, you might want to take extra care with them. Okay, anything else? We are, we are at five o'clock. I'm just going to comb through here for the last question. I'm also going to put the handouts in, hand, in the chat one more time okay. in case you need those. And put my um, Instagram and TikTok handle in. Um, if you have any other questions or like need help as you're going, um, don't hesitate. You can contact me on Instagram or TikTok. Send me a direct message. It's Mr. M I S T E R spelled out Wooly Bear. So Mr. Wooly Bear. And um, I do try to respond pretty quick. So sometimes I'm more helpful than other times, depending on what the question is. But um, I hate to leave you in a lurch, leave you hanging if you have questions, but there's so much information on YouTube and all over the internet about weaving. That's that's how I learned. I just watched videos, tried it, taught myself, experimented. So that's really, that's the best way to learn, but it's nice to have somebody to come to if you do have questions. I think one last good question. Are there any materials that you would not recommend using? Um, again, it depends on what you're making. So for like these wall hangings that I'm making, I I would use anything. Like you could use sticks, you could use plastic bags cut up, you could use paper. In fact, I've seen weavings like this done with newspaper and the way that they weave it and use different colors, it creates pictures and portraits of people. And I saw those in Santa Fe, but you could use anything. You could use corn husks, you could use, I've seen, seen people use like flowers um, and like weave the stems of the flowers in and different types of grass. I mean, any, I would think anything, but don't do that and then think you're gonna wear it for a scarf is the only thing. Like think about the purpose of it first. What do you think, Claire? I think that's exactly it. You have to sort of at least have an idea in mind of what the end use will be. Like yeah. you said, for, you know, something that's gonna be used and perhaps washed a lot don't use a wool that's got a felt if you want to machine wash it or don't use, you know, delicate feathers or flowers or something. Oh yeah, feathers would be pretty, wouldn't they? Yeah. Okay, so thanks for coming to class. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me and practice. Just keep practicing and learning. So, bye.